John Sloan speaking to Reese McKee about five days after his uh, after his war with Perry Goodwin, in which he won by guillotine choke in the third round on Saturday night at Cage Warriors 102. Reese, uh, you're looking a bit better than you did uh, on, on Saturday night and Sunday morning. H- how are you feeling five days after that absolute war? Yeah, I'm feeling a bit better now. I've loosened up and the, the injuries are starting to subside. So, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm happy I got the win that I, that I knew I was going to get. And um, I'm just happy, man. I'm happy to be on the other side of the fight camp and chatting to you. Chronologically, I want to take you through, you know, the entirety of this fight camp. I want to talk a little bit about the stare down, even though you have respect, you might not want to go into that. Talk a bit about the fight. Talk a bit about what's next. So let's talk about the camp. I mean, you came out and said after that you didn't have the best camp in terms of injuries and niggles, uh, and and you put that out publicly as well. It wasn't just something you said to me. And the only other fight camp that I recall you ever actually coming out and saying, you know, I had a pretty a, a pretty treacherous fight camp was when you fought Tommy McCafferty to go 4-0. Oh. I understand that one was maybe maybe similar in a way. This one probably worse. Was this, you know, your your worst fight camp to date? And can you give people a little insight into, into what you had to go through in the weeks leading up to the fight? It was, mate. It probably was one of the worst, like, um, the my conditioning and strength and conditioning wasn't affected this fight camp at all like that was the best it was the best i've ever had in that term but whenever it came to doing mma or any boxing or any pads i was like i was just so many injuries my hands were beat up and uh, my cauliflower ears were beat up which i know people kind of it sounds light but it's heavy like uh i cut myself one one week in the on the boxing ring uh I just couldn't hit a real stride with the MMA training. Again, my conditioning and stuff like that were fantastic, but injuries were just an absolute nightmare. Let's talk a little bit about the stare down. Uh, I saw Peter Carroll say on Twitter that it was it was the most intense stare down that, that we've ever seen you in professional professionally, and I'd agree with that. Uh, and you know, like we like we kind of discussed off air, you are a sensitive guy, uh, and you are quite an emotional guy coming into the fight. I know that from speaking to you. Did that affect you? And did you expect things to get that kind of personal, physical? Uh, and what were your thoughts on that whole kind of uh, saga? My, my thoughts were just trying to stand there and stand as still as I could. I, I, I'm on weight, I'm 155 and a half. So I was just like, I don't want to get too uh, riled up in case I end up flipping falling over. But no, I knew Perry would come at me with something heavy. So I wasn't, I wasn't that shocked, nor was I fired up in the slightest. I actually, I felt he got a bit over emotional. And, and I knew that would play into his game a bit or play into my game because I don't get emotional in a fight uh, where where he does. He fights with his heart in his sleeve sometimes. And I believe that may have been, that could have been a, a, like a, maybe a, a bad thing for him to do, but whatever, mate, you know. Is that a tough process in a fight, not letting your emotions get the better of you? Is that something you've had to work on or have you always had that kind of control? Uh, no, it's not. It's definitely so, it's not something I've always had. Uh, you know, sometimes I just want to scrap and throw down. And I know we did a bit on Saturday night, but there were times where you could just go absolutely mental and just and blow your tank out in a in a minute and a half, you know. So uh, uh, listening to the corner helps pull you back a bit. And, you know, you know you're there to do a job as well. But I'm, I'm phenomenally calm anyway, so. I was going to ask you if you ever thought you lost your composure uh, on Saturday night because... I personally, I thought you lost the first round and the way you came out in the second round in the first minute was so, so aggressive and your output was so high. I thought at that point that maybe your emotions were, were taking over. Or was that all strategic? Uh, so the first round was a measure and out match. It was just like, so closing them little gaps. Like if Terry missed, then by the time he came back, I was like half an inch closer to him. And that was something we'd done. Yes, I, I did lose a round and I didn't, I didn't plan to lose a round, but it was a measure and out process. Then when the second round came, I was just right. Let's let's put gloves on them. So, and that's what we done there. Uh, so no, like uh, no, I don't feel I lost my composure on Saturday night. Um, no, I, I actually felt it was really good going into the third as well. I had to really like have a like a mellow moment and be like, right, I need to fight so smart here to win this last round, and and that's what I done. So no, I was impressed with my composure during that. In fairness. Yeah, well, I, I I said this to you uh, after the Terry Brazier fight. I thought if you had one thing that was uh, that was your downfall, I thought it was your cardio and conditioning. You proved me and anyone who had that concern wrong on Saturday night. Do you feel like between the Terry Brazier fight and just now, because of your strength and conditioning, do you feel like your conditioning has improved or was I just mistaken? 
I think, mate, to be honest, you were just mis- mistaken. Like, I'm no one to be a workhorse. Like, I like I go to, I like any gym I go to is fine. They'll always come away with saying Reese can just keep going all day. Uh, so yes, I did show in that Terry fight. Maybe it was that style of fight, but my condition was fantastic. My strength and condition was brilliant. I've been doing a lot of rowing on the rowing machine. Uh, I just feel like my numbers are, are crazy. So, no, my condition's fantastic, and it, it was good. It was good to to show that. I love, I love, I love getting into the nitty gritty because I, I like really thrive there. Yeah, I said that to you initially after when you're kind of arguably two two rounds down. Uh, although my friends that watched the fight, they said that you they thought you won the second. Yeah, I one didn't win it. One apiece. Yeah, one apiece. Anyway, but going into that fight, you know, blood everywhere. You've both thrown heavy leather. It's hard to. It's hard to kind of keep your mind sharp and keep your fight IQ in those times and keep searching for those openings. Like, it was quite an obscure guillotine choke at the same time. Yeah. Is, is that something you've always had in you as well? You know, the ability to, to search for openings, even in the trenches? Yeah, well, it was actually funny. I remember uh, you done an interview with Perry and, and he said he, feel, he felt I would I couldn't keep that pressure going too long. And I remember at the start of the third round, I said to Rodney, right, go out of the corner, go out, like there were 20 seconds left, I said go out, I'm going to show them how fresh I am, and I walked out into the middle of the octagon, and I just stood there and smiled and put my tongue out, and that was like a like a, I am fresh, so uh, that was a nice moment, but the as for like the, the fight IQ and stuff, it's just how I train, I train like, I train quite I spar quite hard, like I'd probably be one of the hardest, like I, I spar like a fight sometimes, and I, I feel that gives me an invaluable asset when I'm fighting yeah, completely, completely. Uh, and I want to talk, do you think you showed people a different side to Reese Mickey, you know, digging deep and getting the finish in the third round? Because, you know, you've kept up your 100% finish rate, but, you know, you, you're used to getting that quite early. Is it good to kind of prove some of the doubters wrong? And also, you know, Reese has no grappling. I heard you say that in the media. Room. Is it good to good to show your initiative on the ground too? Yeah, it's good for me. Maybe, like, I'm sure other people like seeing the faster stuff and so do I, but... I, I'm a fighter and I like to fight too, so it's important for me to get a bit more time. Like these fight camps, so to speak, are long, so you know it's nice to get it's nice to get a bit more time and a bit more video and photo footage and all that carry on. <laughs> In all honesty, we, when you saw this fight with Perry playing out prior to prior to it going down on Saturday night, how how did you see it going? Um, Funny, I had a dream. I had a dream last week. I sound, I sound like fucking Conor McGregor or something, but I had a dream and uh, I knew, I, I thought it would be a bloodbath. I really thought it would be a bloodbath, but I thought it would be a lot cleaner. Like, I thought like I would go out in the first round and start him, and, and that's not because I underestimated him. Like, I, I know he felt underestimated, but I, if anything, I, I, like, I really rated him, but I just rated myself so high that I thought I would have done him in the first, but we got, like, it happened to be the third, and it was a bloodbath, so it was half right. Was the atmosphere kind of unlike anything you ever had before? Not just because it was fight of the night, but anyone who knows Indigo at the O2 knows that it's kind of built with tears and all the noise just goes down into the octagon. Could you feel that as you were fighting, the kind of electricity of the crowd? It was cool. There was a stage in the second round where uh, it's when the commentators go, we've got a war at the Indigo or a scrap at the Indigo. And I remember in that fight, actually feeling at that moment, I was like, ah, this is the right tear up. Like, this is a tear now. So I remember feeling that and hearing the roar of the crowd. But... Uh, it didn't really get it, it. made me laugh, but it wasn't like it wasn't like getting lost on it or anything. What did you underestimate about Perry, if anything? His ability to take the shots. Yeah. Uh, but I also feel I rushed him a bit at times. Uh, but his ability to take a shot and like his movement was very good. I knew he was good on the on the on the back foot because he he stays around the edge, which is very rare for people to do against a longer guy. But I knew he was comfortable there, and I think. Jacobson, the main mistake he made was Jackson thought he was winning when Perry was on the outside, where that's not the case for Perry. Like that's where he likes to be. I believe when you made your pro debut in nineteen, Bama measured you and you measured six foot and a half, I think. Cage Warriors measured you before this fight clearly and you, and you measured six foot three. I thought people are meant to stop growing when they're eighteen, nineteen. I know. I'm hoping to stop growing soon. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah, I know, I, I know. I, I, might, I think, technically speaking, I'm between six foot two and six foot three. Yeah, same as I, same as me, mate. I'm sure. Uh, but you know, I want to talk a little bit about uh, about what you mentioned immediately after the fight. You know, um, people who have Perry on social media, Instagram, Facebook, like, will know that he lost his good friend on the Sunday before. 
you've obviously kind of got first-hand uh, experience going into a fight off the back of a bad loss uh, with your father back at uh, back at Bama 27. Where did you get this information and what was your reaction uh, like this? Because we talked about this briefly off air and I found it really, really interesting what you were saying because I've never had this conversation with any fighter before about how you almost had to to cut out your sensitive side. And that that that, that might, might, make, might make you sound like an asshole, but it's, it's necessary. But what was that like when you heard? I mean, was it hard to kind of to, to strip that back in your mind? Yeah, so I think like one of my friends seen on like, you know, the Instagram Explorer page. Like obviously yeah. So, they're, they're following the fight so if they, they kind of they told me the information not in a way where like it was just in a way where like here's it like is he still kind of fighting or something like that yeah and I was like I mean I, I said this is the first I've heard so it was hard on me and in a, in a it wasn't hard it wasn't hard on me in the sense of like the loss but like it was hard because I knew what Perry was going through at that time uh and as I put up a post today it's all about respect I respect my opponent so so much and uh, so it was hard for me not to reach out and just show him a bit of support. You know, I, I very much have to remember that I have to fight Perry on the Saturday. So it was important for me to stay separate from from the emotion of that and uh, just continue with the job. But it was the first thing I said after the fight. Yeah. And, you know, I, I remember when you lost your father, uh, when you did the preview for Bama 28, when, when you were meant to fight him eventually for the first time i remember you saying once once i stepped in i was not leaving because it was the last fight that that you and your father talked about also on instagram the week before the fight i think in one of your questions and answer sessions someone asked you what do you think are, are the toughest qualities perry possesses you replied heart and durability you know when you have that kind of fire in your belly of losing someone it, it kind of that kind of hardens up his best qualities as well Mm -hmm, absolutely like he probably he there's no doubt in my mind he went in there with a with a killer be killed mind mind frame i have no doubt either i have no doubt in my mind either um and that's something that that i had to respect you know obviously i didn't i didn't respect it in the way where i actually thought about the the situation he was in but i respected it and i knew how, how much heart he was coming with and uh yeah like i just i, I wish i wish them all the best really moving forward with him i hope that they get over it. I, I know it's tough Let's talk about the weight cut because, uh, you know, I, I want to talk a bit about that. The first question I have for you is what, what's, what are the tough parts or the toughest part about a weight cut? And that seems like a stupid question because it's obvious, you know, it's mentally taxing, it's physically taxing. But people like me have never, have never been through having to, having to lose 10 or 11 pounds of their body weight overnight. Can you describe in, in a feeling or, or in a few words what, what it's like, what you feel like physically, mentally in that moment? It's tough, man. Like I went there. <clears throat> I arrived in London, uh, and I was one seventy. Uh, I had to weigh one fifty five. Uh, what sixteen hours later? You know, like, <laughs> like that there. And when I when I reach seventy seven or one seventy, like I'm lean. I'm I'm like I'm well trimmed down ready. Like I don't I don't walk at seventy seven kilo, or nor is it easy. To, it's not even easy to get to seventy seven or one seventy. So to do a fifteen pound cut from there, like, is digging deep, and this is something that I've done my whole career, and and you know, so it was certainly tough, and and the time that it's taken to make one fifty five is getting a lot longer, which is which is also a problem. Because it's unhealthier. Because my body's just so it used to like say for example I done one bath and I could have lost one point two kilo just say easy counting. Mm. Well, now, for example, the bass are taking point six of a kilo, so it's like half the half the amounts come off compared to what it, the way it used to be. So it's almost like your body's fighting against you. Yeah, almost, you know. And then I come out of these fights, and I know, I know I eat a lot of food. Like the the first this week, I'll have a lot of junk food, but then after that, the body weight doesn't come down the way it normally does. And I, listen, I, I'm six foot three. Like this is. You know, this isn't a laziness issue or or a clean eating issue. You know, I I any time I sign the the contract to make the weight, I make the weight. Never a problem, never an issue. Uh, but it's it's just getting tough. What's it like in in the fight camp? Because I imagine as much as you'll be thinking about the fight, you'll also kind of have that that black part in your mind of the the dread of of leading up to that that twenty four hour period. Do you ever let that affect you mentally Mentally before? I mean, did you get that dread a couple of weeks out of, of what you're about to go through mentally and physically in terms of the weight cut? To be honest, you do. Like, I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Like, again, I think maybe two, three weeks out, I was 81, 81, 82 kilo, like heavy, heavy weight. And 
again, that this is already when I'm five weeks in deep and clean. I still never free to go. My body weight's not come down that much. So it's tough. It, it takes like the highest mental strength. And again, I've always said my mental strength's different to any other fighter in, in, on the roster. So that gets me through it. But it's, you know, it's, I need to make the right decision for Reese McKee. And, and I, re- I really feel I'll be a force at, if it is at 170 or wherever it's back at 155. I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the best for me always. When you talk about that mental strength, where do you think that comes from? Because I remember I interviewed uh, Terry Brazo before the Chris Bungard fight, and he was talking about how he, I think the way he described it was that you're too tough for your own good. Uh, I think I think he he mentioned a part of your fight where uh, where you, he hit you with five hammer fists uh, from either Mount or, or or he was maybe in your guard, yeah, uh, and you turned around to the commentary team and smiled at them. Where where does that come from? That that grit and determination. I, mean, I just love it. I'm so grateful of the life I live. Like, um, like I get to fight people in arenas. I don't have to do a nine to five job. Like, I work for myself. Like, I'm just, I'm just happy to be to be part of stuff at, at times. So, uh, but where, like, the heart, I, I don't class it as heart. I just find it as like I'm in a fight and I want to win the fight and I do anything I can to win the fight. So, if that means taking five hammer fists and, and having a laugh, then so be it. That's what we'll do. The first time I ever heard heard you uh, mention the the move to welterweight was when you first won uh, the uh, the first world lightweight title when you knocked out Barnett in the first round in that rematch. That was the first time it was on your lips, and then it's it's kind of been on your lips increasingly since then. You know, through the Brazier fight, after that, since since signing for Cage Warriors, was there something worse about about this weight cut that made you think you know I, I I don't want to be doing this anymore. Or was it just the, the fact that everything took a lot longer, or maybe it could have maybe it could have been a combination of the factors like the strenuous camp you'd had along with the the weight, the weight more diff- being more difficult to fall off. Yeah, it, it could have been what you just said. Um, but I've done two camps in a row. I've done two weight cuts in a row, and and it's the pattern. The pattern that's that's following is is getting is going the wrong way, you know, and. Uh, Listen, I'm not one of these fights. I don't want to miss weight ever in my career, nor do I want to be even the first time I miss weight to be for a fucking world title fight. Yeah, I'm trying to fix stuff before they go broke, and that's why I've that's why I'm having the career I'm having. Like, that's why like things are going well because I, I'm able to spot problems before they come. So, um, that's just really where we're at now. I just it's sitting down with Cage Wars. When we signed with Cage Wars, they knew like they they. It was a it was a deal that that said I won't be locked to lightweight because that that yeah. won't be for the duration of the deal. I want to try welterweight. Who knows if this could like it might not be a permanent thing, but I want to try it and then and then we'll see. You know. Yeah. So so you don't see the potential move to one seventy as as a permanent move because you know like Tim Barnett he had two fights at one seventy then back down to lightweight. You still see that as a possibility. No. Well, if I go up to if I go up to one seventy and. and I like it. Have a ball, feel good, which I know I will. I know, like I know I will. I do. I do most of my camp at uh, one seventy five, one seventy six. No, he- maybe, maybe heavier. Uh, so um, I know it's something that's going to be. I know it's something that's going to be a smart decision. How much does winning this Cage Warriors lightweight title mean to you? Because it seemed like when you signed, it kind of means everything, and it seems like now it still it still means a lot to you, but. If that's not if that's not the next uh, next immediate thing, your next your next move is gonna uh, move be to move up and, and go on a run at one seventy, because you've already won a world title at lightweight. How crucial do you see this Cage Warriors title? Like I know I'm signing the Cage Warriors and stuff, and the goal is to win the title, but it's not for me. Like I just want to keep rack of wins. I want the title. I do want the title, but like it's like saying. If someone offered me a 145 title shot, a featherweight title shot tomorrow morning, would I do it? It's like, no, I wouldn't do it because cause it's not smart. I could, I mean, I could probably cut an arm off and make the weight, but like, it's not smart, you know? Yes. So if I have to go win the title at 170, then that's, then that's what I'll do. You know, whatever weight I'm fighting at, I'll, I'll, I'll go after the title, but I'm not, like, I don't feel, for instance, the, the lightweight title doesn't mean more to me than the welterweight title, if that makes sense. I just spoke to Jack Grant. He said that he's willing to fight you or Herbert for the lightweight title next. It, it seems like you two have kind of kind of have emerged as the two front runners for that shot. The question I have for you is: How significant is is Bama twenty seven, or significant at all in deciding who gets the next title shot? If anyone doesn't know, Reese fought 
Herbert in December of 2016 uh, and finished him within within three minutes of the very first round, maybe even two minutes. Uh, do you do you think that that's something that the matchmaker should be taking into account when they when they determine who gets the next shot? I mean, I guess yeah. I guess yeah. I guess you. I guess you do. Like we've we've fought before. Um, actually, I, I always forget about this fight because you said Bama there, and I was like, what, what relevance is that? But like, I, yeah, of course it plays a of course it plays a huge part. Like, of course it does. Um, Jack Grant's a beast too, so it'd be an absolutely amazing fight. Uh, Jai's a beast. Jai had a great win. Uh, I'm a beast. I had a great win. Uh, so whatever happens really happens you know I, i'm excited to hear from cage warriors what they want to do they they know that uh they know that anything less than a title shot and i'll not even consider it they also know that i'm interested in going to 170 so i'm really like i'm really not too bothered what happens i'm relaxed and calm and <clears throat> whatever weight i'm fighting in i'll i'll be uh i'll be eventually getting the title anyway late june cage warriors 105 live at the apollo an amazing arena that's when Jack Grant told me he's looking to fight for the lightweight title. Now, I know that you're dealing with a few niggles. Body enabling, would you be would you be right in considering that that date? I don't I don't I don't know if I will be body enabling by that date, man, to be honest. Uh, um, so that, that that I guess that's an issue, isn't it? Like uh how many weeks is that away? Um so it would be eleven weeks, I think. 11 weeks I, I just fought this weekend and then before that I fought 12 weeks do you know what I mean yeah 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 I mean I could certainly do it yeah but would it be the best Reese McKee probably not I mean I'd find a will and a way to make it the best but uh, I'm not too sure it's something I need to I need to talk to Cage Warriors about first but it'll all, it'll all play out good yeah yeah well you know I asked you this question uh, when we were going back and forth on WhatsApp but I the question I wanted to ask for you is how satisfied you were overall with your uh, with your two cage wars performances so far and I know I'm sounding like a really really harsh critic but I uh, don't think you've performed to the best of your ability in either I think Jefferson was up on points before you finished them in my opinion so was Perry yeah on a scale of one to ten, how satisfied uh, satisfied are you with your with your performances so far? But, but I will I will give you uh, I will give you credit in saying that both of those guys are are far better fighters than their records or, than their records suggest. Um, how satisfied? Are, like, I mean, if we were to really sit down and break down my whole career, I could probably give you on like three performances that I was actually happy with. Yeah. But the important thing is going to my sure dog and seeing nine of the, nine of the wins, you know? So, mm. I mean, I'm very satisfied. Like I'm very satisfied of, of a two fights, December and March, like close, that's close time for fights. And I've come out with two wins. Um, so I, I am, I'm, I'm really satisfied and I'm excited moving forward. You know, obviously I'm, I'm always looking for that perfect performance and, I feel I only really got one perfect performance in my whole career so far, but I'll, I'll have plenty more coming. Uh, it's like the second Tim Barnett fight. Of course it is, yeah. Yeah, perfect. that was flawless, yeah. yeah. Perfect, yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, what, what was I going to say moving forward? Jack Grant, uh, he what he did say to me, uh, and I just told you this off air, is he said that he, he didn't think you'd shown uh, nearly the extent of your capabilities in the fight on Saturday with Perry. Do you agree with that? Yeah, he's spot on. He's spot on, but like Jack's a smart fella. He knows like he's um yeah, no, he's 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 bang on. What's your opinion on the on the title picture? Let, let's hear John's prediction and what what do you think should happen next for everyone? Why well I, I think well if I was the matchmaker and the question that, that I'm kind of asking over who gets the next title shot is how relevant Bama twenty seven is and how relevant they see that, you know. I, I don't see how how when when two people are kind of emerging as equal in consideration for the title, I think the only determining factor should be have they ever fought before and who emerged victorious and the better fighter on that night, which back in December of 2016 was you. Uh, but the other thing that I think we've got to take into consideration is the fact that you're you're talking so so kind of presently about about the move to 170. That's something that, that Cage Warriors a promotion have got to bear in mind because the last thing any promotion wants is is you know someone winning a title and then vacating it. Yeah, uh, they like to have a champion who's who's defending. They can kind of build a name off there. So it, it, it kind of swings and roundabouts, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. You know, I'm not interested in doing a, a soaring back and and winning a title and then pissing off. Um, 
So, me, at the minute, I'm pretty chilled. I want to hear officially from Cage Warriors before I make any decision about welterweight or lightweight. So, I'm really like, I'm, that's why I can't really give you an answer to say what I would do or what I will do because I, I feel like it's important to sit down. You know, they might they might think Mason, Mason, uh, Mason Jones or Donovan Desme, they might think they could get it. Who knows? Nobody knows what's going on on inside Cage Warriors' mind. So, yeah, I mean, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you uh, before I did the interview with Jack. I was gonna ask you whether in June um, a title eliminator would would interest you in, in a rematch with Jai Herbert, but uh, I'm assuming that that's going to be a no. And if, uh, even if so, if Jack Grant wants to return on that date, then then it's unlikely that that Cage Warriors make the fight. Yeah, well, I'm I'm just not interested in. I think I've done my work a lightweight, like to grant a title shot. If not, then I'll go to welterweight. If that makes sense, you know, I've I'm a world champion coming from another promotion. I'm nine and nine and two and one all finishes. You know, uh, I'm not saying this in a in a way where I feel like I deserve one more than anyone, but I do feel I deserve it. Yeah, I do. Completely. So if if you know, I might, even if it's not the best, Reese McKee, you'd still you'd still consider June just because it's a chance to fight for the title. I'm not saying I, I'm not saying I won't consider it, but we'll we'll sit and talk about it. Yeah, see, I mean that's that's mature in itself that that, that you're getting a chance for the world title and, and you would consider even so I, I I remember you saying that in the media room after at Cage Warriors one oh two. You said even if they did offer a grant, you'd still have to weigh up, you know, what what another weight cut could do to your body and then decide from there. I guess it's it. Like it's if people don't know me, the one thing they should know is I'll always do what's best for me. Like I'm not there to sell hundred tickets or I really couldn't care if this fight they, is the fight they really want. If if it's smart for me to fight some guy in my backyard and for Cage Warriors, then that's what I'll do. Um, but until I hear from Cage Warriors, I know nothing. Talking of that welterweight division, who does Reese McKee want? Who does Reese um I don't know. I really don't know. I, I haven't looked in. Who does John Sloan want? Uh, I don't know. I think it would be the, uh, a fight between you and the winner of Aaron Khalid uh, versus Tom uh, Tom Kong. I think that's a really good fight to make. Uh, uh, depending on who emerges victorious in April, but I do understand that that uh, that Aaron probably does deserve does deserve the rematch with Ross or whoever's champion. Here's here's a question: uh, Lahore and Dalby, who wins, uh, and the winner of that, who wins out of them and Ross Houston? In your opinion. What was a heavy question. Yeah, that was, um, yeah. I think that I think Dalby will beat Lahore. Disagree with you on that. I just, I, I really just haven't watched, and I like Lahore just kind of doesn't impress me that much. Like he just doesn't. He's, he's someone, he's someone that I believe uh, journalists have mentioned to you before, and you've said that you, that you'd have no problem in taking that fight at once. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're you're making a fight right here, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, I want. Like, I don't really care who I fight, I, I, I never have. I just I'm not I'm not going in the welterweight division thinking I'm ten fights away from the title. Mm. I'm going to go in there, beat someone, potentially beat someone else, and then get a title shot. If not in that second fight, that's how it's going to go down in my eyes. So like I don't think like me like this is the thing. A lot of people are asking if you go to welterweight, does it put you to the back of the queue? What what would you say to that? No, no. I mean. By by no means can you jump up to the most stacked division in Cage Warriors and you know go go straight into straight into fighting for a belt after two yeah, wins. Uh, but I think if you were to go up to welterweight uh, and fight someone within the top five, then on a two fight win streak at lightweight, you'd probably be one fight away from the title shot. Yeah. But I'm not Ian yeah. Dean. So. No, I understand, but I, I I think people who think that it puts me to the back. Nah, definitely not. I mean, what do they expect you to do? Nine, two, and one, former Bama lightweight champion. Do they expect you to fight someone that's three and zero? Nah, I know. I no, I know, but that's what you know. People, people think. And also, add, add to that what I will say: as as much as it is a big opportunity for you, I think you'll find it really hard to to match yourself up with 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 someone like Adam Proctor that's trying to make a name for themselves at welterweight. Because I, I don't think I don't think I fight with you at welterweight. You know, for someone who's at the back of the queue, it doesn't make much sense for them to take on you. It's, it's too dangerous for not enough reward. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I'm maybe asking questions. I'm asking questions off the cuff now, but I noticed you said that there was only one fight uh, that you've been happy with in your career, and it was the Tim Two fight. Yeah. Why? And can you identify anything that happened uh, in the lead up to that? Well, not not why, because obviously it was it was a great performance. But why do you think that was your best performance? 
because I wanted I I don't know maybe because I wanted that fight for so long, but I uh, also I just feel stylistically I I, I could have done that the first time. Like I I genuinely believe if I was well the first time that's what would have happened. But well, you were winning the round to be fair. Yeah, just maybe like just, but I didn't feel like I was winning the round or like. You know, I was so so sick. Like that fight, I was one fifty six. Yeah, you've told me that before. Yeah, I remember that. So, um, I don't know why. I think it was perfect because I've seen it so many times, and uh, again, I I was just a different level already. Completely, completely. And uh, the last couple of questions, I asked you this off here. What's it like walking around with with a face like you've been hit by a bus? I mean, to get some dodgy stares. Yeah, it's starting to go away. But like a lot of people, a lot of people just ask. Like a lot of people are blunt. They're like. Or, or someone said, were you, were you talking when you should have been listening? I thought that was quite a good one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what did you reply to them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I don't really, I don't bring it, like, I don't bring the attention on. I just kind of, yeah, whatever kind of thing. But I went into I suppose the... you look like a bit of an idiot if you're advertising yourself as a fighter, first and foremost. Yeah, I went into the travel agents yesterday and, and one of the girls, she was actually saying to me, oh, you must have been, or you must have been fighting or something. And, and one of the other girls beside her, she watched the fight, so... She, oh, really? She bumped and blew my praises rather than me having to do it, so... Oh, that, that's that, that's quite decent. And secondly, you're, you're famously hang, hanging out in hipster coffee shops. Uh, I believe one of them, was it, was it Poets Corner? Did they make you your own cake to, to say congratulations for winning the fight? They made me a cheesecake, yep. Yeah. They made me a cheesecake. <laughs> how, how much of that is left? Uh, there, I think there's one bit, and I, I had one earlier, so... They're, they're, that will be done tonight. But uh, do, you, do you have a boost bar over there? Do you boost? Yeah, yeah, mate. We get we got that in Scotland. Yeah, I don't know. Di- you, diabetes don't capital know. over here. Uh, of course, we've got boosts. I know you don't have TVs and stuff, so I'm not sure if you have boost bars. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, I better wrap this up because how long have we been going? About about half an hour. Uh, but thanks so much for coming on, Reese. Oh, good, mate. Thank you very much. <laughs>